Welcome to episode six of the Dads Unplugged podcast. I am your co-host, Nelson Osorio. Really excited to have uh, this vibrant guest, Saul Blinkoff, today. And uh, I'm here with my co-host, Sean Pace. Hello, everyone. Welcome again. Uh, we are super excited. Very grateful for his time. Uh, quick introduction for Saul. For those that don't know, Saul Blinkoff is a amazing Hollywood filmmaker who has worked on a number of high-profile Movies with clients like Walt Disney, Nelson, uh, not Nelson, Netflix, and Amazon. Movies including the Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mulan, Tarzan, which I sing all the time. And currently, Saul is not only the supervising producer at DreamWorks, but he is also an amazing husband and an always giving back father. Welcome today on our show. We appreciate your time so much, Saul. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for having me. This is such an exciting opportunity. I love being able to have uh, just an opportunity to talk about what it is to be a dad. So thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So uh, let's start with something really simple. I mean, what's the family dynamic look like for you? How many kids, married, not married? What What's going on in your life right now? What's going on in my cave, right? We all live <laughs> in our caves. Um, well, in my cave, uh, I have a wife, Marion. Uh, we're married uh, just about 20 years, which is wow. incredible. It's like Congrats. I even say that to you guys. Thanks. I said to you guys, I'm like, boy, that sounds like an old guy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that sounds like my dad, but actually I'm married 20 years. And my kids actually do tell me I'm an old guy. So there you go. Uh, I have four kids. My youngest is a girl. She's uh, eight years old. And I have a son who's almost 13. I have another daughter who's 14 and another daughter who's going to be 17. Translation, she drives a car without me in it. That's called license. What? <laughs> Freedom. Yeah. So, yeah, I got four kids and we have a puppy. So uh, that's who's living in my cave and, uh, you know, full time job and balancing life like all of us are. And uh, just trying to trying to grow, you know, trying to be better men. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's really cool. Can I can I ask? I always like to figure out, like, you have obviously an amazing career. At what point were the kids introduced and, and you working with like, you know, the Pocahontas, DreamWorks, all that stuff? Were you already doing things like that when you had your first kid or was that? Yeah, I, yeah I started on, at Disney as an animator in the mid 90s. So I worked on, you know, like you said, Pocahontas, Hunchback, Mulan, Tarzan, all those movies before kids. Uh, it was uh, 2002. I got married, moved out to L.A. because the Disney studios that I was at was in Orlando, Florida. We worked at, at Disney World. If you ever remember, they had the, it's called the Disney Hollywood Studios today. It used to be called Disney MGM Studios. Mm -hmm. And we used to have an animation tour there that I worked in my 20s. The best times, great times. That's where I met my wife or re met my wife. We went to high school together, actually, but we, what? we never knew wow. each other in high school. We went to high school in New York together, but we met in a mall in South Florida when I was promoting the movie Pocahontas. What? Met her briefly and then re met at Disney World when she was on an internship and I was on an internship. Crazy story. Um, yeah, just totally amazing. Uh, anyway, so. Yeah, so we, we got married 2002, uh, returned to Disney as a director, directing a Winnie the Pooh movie. And that's really my kid's entree. You know, it's funny because the movies and television shows that I've chosen to work on while being a dad, I chose those because I was a father and because I had kids. You know, I wasn't interested in Winnie the Pooh before I had kids. I wasn't interested in preschool television. Mm -hmm. But now as a father... And just a father that wants his kids to watch entertainment that's not going to just entertain, but also give them some values or gives them some, give them some life lessons. That's mm -hmm. definitely uh, impacted the choices I make as a filmmaker. So working on Winnie the Pooh, specifically those characters, uh, while I was becoming a dad and, and having a toddler was just incredible. And uh, uh, so that's the, a lot of memories I have, you know, working on Doc McStuffins. I was a director on the show mm -hmm. Doc McStuffins. And I took that. I still remember my agent calling me and saying, uh, what do you think about Doc McStuffins? And I said it out loud. Doc McStuffins, and my daughter at the time, she was like three or four. And she's like, Doc McStuffins? I'm like, why, you heard of it? I never heard of it. She goes, Dad, <laughs> it's my favorite show. I'm like, oh, do you want Daddy to work on that? Please, you know? So, oh, yeah, wow. it's definitely it's definitely impacted the things I do. Now, you know, I still have one preschooler. You know, not really preschool. She's eight, but she still, she loves uh, the show I'm doing now, which is Madagascar, A Little Wild. It's on Hulu and Peacock, Pe Peacock mm -hmm, and it's... Uh, mm -hmm. A dream workshop. Even my oldest kids love it also, but my older kids are now like, Dad, are you going to do something that's a little more, you know, a little older now? You know, <laughs> <laughs> something for me that I could tell my friends because they don't know the stuff you do, Dad. I'm like, <laughs> anyway, so it's good stuff. 
No, that's, I mean, it sounds like you've had a very interesting career and now you've got a podcast called Life of Awesome, which yeah. I'm thoroughly enjoying. Thank you very much for, for doing that and sharing your, your stories with it. How, how is it balancing all of your, your obligations as a, as a dad, as a husband, along with your intense creative ability that you have to, to be able to keep, keep it all kind of straight, especially right now during, as we're still in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot in my podcast about this and, and I, I speak a lot about this, you know, life is, um, quite often life is like we're on a canoe and the current of the river just takes us. You know, life is always moving, whether we're working for an employer, our job, you know, we started our job and you wake up five years from now and you're like, oh, you were promoted here and there. And it's the current takes you or your kids, you know, you guys are dads, right? So you wake up one day and your kids, you know, it's five years in or 10 years, where did the time go? And because life moves so fast, we have to stop and stop the canoe with a paddle and clarity where we want to go. So the point I'm making is that having clarity of what kind of father I want to be, what kind of children do I want to help nurture? It's not what kind of children do I want to have. We can't control who our children become. Mm -hmm. What we can control is the relationship that I want to have with my children. And, you know, balancing creativity, life, work, any of those things with fatherhood, it's very important to make sure as fathers, parents in general, that we are clear and that we have moments in our lives where we're reflecting on what kind of a dad do I want to be. I'll tell you, when my wife was pregnant mm -hmm. with our first, I wasn't a dad yet. I was a prospective dad. I was on deck. You guys, you remember that <laughs> feeling? Remember that feeling of what it's like to, you know, I don't know for your wives, but for me, and I think I've heard from most women that the baby is most active in mommy's belly at night. And I still remember those nights lying next to my wife and her going, oh, feel right now, right now. So she'd take yep. my hand and put it on her belly, right? And I'd feel the kicks. And I'd be, oh, that's awesome. And you know what I did, guys? I took my hand away from her belly, turned over, and slept for the next eight hours while she had an alien inside her stomach mm -hmm. kicking and pushing, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> it was just a novelty for me for about three seconds, but she had to deal mm -hmm. with this night after night after night, mm -hmm. and uh, which is interesting because it's amazing how like a mother's love for a child is very unique and, and special. Right. And, and and it's not like you're loving this baby that's born because you've never met them. Think of the investment the mother makes, you know, while she's nurturing that baby, knowing mm -hmm. that she can't have alcohol, can't have sushi. You know, there's always there's already mm -hmm. sacrifices you've made in the relationship, but knowing that you have something inside you growing that is dependent on you, not dependent on dad, by the way, dependent on mom. Yep. And a dad's job while mom is pregnant is just take care of your wife. But I bring it up because I remember during those nine months, you know, that's a window of time. In life, we have different windows of time that we can't control when they end or when they start necessarily. There's a window of time. Childhood is a window of time. Mm -hmm. And I remember during that window of time, did we set up the nursery? Yeah. Did we pick out potential names? Yeah. Did we find out which stroller to get? Yeah. But you take all that stuff away. That window of time is an important opportunity to wrap my head around clarifying one thing. I'm a potential father. What kind of a dad do I want to be? Hmm. Who is my dad? What kind of relationship did I have with my dad? Was it good? Hmm. Was it not good? No relationships are perfect. What can I learn from that relationship that I want to put into this? And, and by the way, we know nothing about fatherhood when you're a dad on deck. Mm -hmm. but the moment moments in life, we have to make sure we clarify. So as a dad now that's balancing creativity and all these things, as, as busy as I am, and we all are very busy, we have to have moments to stop and clarify and, and take an accounting on how am I doing? Mm. And, and uh, another thing that my wife and I talk, talk about a lot is that if you were to make a list of all the qualities you want your children to have, you know, mm. patience, integrity, tenacity, humility, respect, you know, sensitivity, kindness, whatever it is, confidence, confidence. Don't we want our kids to be confident, right? Yep. If you make a list of all those things, the greatest way that we can ever teach our kids to be those things is for us to be those things. Mm. You see, children are ultimately an opportunity for us to remind ourselves to work on our own character. That's what it is. 
And you know, kids will find out when you when you have hypocrisy, you don't promise your kids something, oh, they'll remind you, right? My yeah. daughter does it. This happened like two weeks ago. My mother came to visit and we bought these beautiful teas from this company that a friend of ours has called Art of Tea. There you go. I just plugged his company. It's the most, inc- <laughs> the most incredible tea flavors. Wait, so is he one of our sponsors? Is he? Uh, we're, we're, well, we're, he should be. Okay, cool. <laughs> he should be. <laughs> throw it out there. I Sorry. like it. You know what? He should. He's an incredible guy, incredible company. And the flavors that he has, it's like Earl Grey cream and like butterscotch. I mean, incredible. You smell them. He has a pumpkin pie. Uh, he has uh bitter chocolate, like incredible things. So we bought these beautiful black bags of tea and my mom was coming to visit. And I, my daughter's like, when are we going to open them? I'm like, oh, we're going to open them when my mom comes. And when grandma comes to visit, we're going to open them. And she came for a week and we never opened them. And after grandma left, my eight-year-old comes to me, daddy, you lied. I'm like, what do you mean Ooh. I lied? <laughs> I never lie. I'm like Superman. I never lie, Lois. You know, <laughs> what do you mean I lied? Just, but, but you said we were going to open the tea and then we never did the tea. I'm like, mm. you're, you're right. And I apologized to her. And right there, I showed her a couple things. It's possible that people that we love will let us down. People we love will let us down. Mm-hmm. And we talk about that, guys. It's just tea. Not for an eight-year-old, it's not. Right. For an eight-year-old, it's my father who I trust, who is my rock, sometimes will let me down. Mm-hmm. And what I need to do as a dad after that is I need to work on building that trust again. Guess what? Even with an eight-year-old. Because an eight-year-old will one day be a 16-year-old, will one day yep. be a 20-year-old. And the foundation that we build with our children will grow into the foundation for the relationship that we have with them for life. Mm-hmm. But put us aside in our egos, the relationships that they have with other people for the rest sure. of their lives. And isn't that our job as a dad to make sure that we take this window of childhood and provide for our kids a structure to learn about the world and about relationships. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I love that you mentioned it. It's, it's shifting the, not the blame factor, but it's not when kids are adults, it's not like, wow, what are you doing wrong? It's like, wow, it's, it's the parents that take that responsibility and say, it's because of us that oh, you yeah. turned out a big portion of you turns out a certain way because the parents have that influence. Uh, and it's wonderful to hear that you just really take ownership of that. Uh, well, you oh, and for your sure. Girl. Yeah. Yeah. You know awesome. what else is like, look, we have three girls and a boy and like it or not, you know, my daughters, when they go out someday and they're looking for their husbands, whether they realize it or not, mm-hmm. their ideal or ideas of what a husband should be is what they saw growing up in their home. Correct. Mm-hmm. Right. Isn't that true? And also, you know, seeing how I treat my wife and I hope mm-hmm. that my girls will say, Hey, at least I hope I find a guy who treats me the way my dad tra- taught my, um, you know, treated my wife. And the same yeah. thing for my son. My son will be looking how to respect women one day mm-hmm. by looking, does, does daddy respect mommy? You know, does daddy appreciate her? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, my wife is an incredible woman and, you know, she, you know, cooks dinner like almost every night. Daddy cooks too. And we can talk about that later because I make the most insane tomato sauce. I spent two years trying to perfect tomato sauce, like obsessed. Like I wanted to make, Michael Jordan quality tomato sauce, the greatest in the planet. We'll talk. You're about setting that. the bar pretty high for this Dude, tomato sauce. I'm telling you, <laughs> I spent. There, there's no video on making tomato sauce on YouTube that I haven't seen. There's no recipe that I'm not aware of. I've called chefs. I've tried every. I have the technique down. It takes two and a half hours, and it's liquid gold. It's incredible. Anyway, another story. But <laughs> I bring it up for this reason. You know, before I started making this tomato sauce, my wife make dinner almost every night and she's from the table and i'd be like yeah thanks honey thanks for dinner we eat and we have a couple of foodies the kids and every night my wife puts dinner down and anyone who cooks for a family you can relate to what i'm about to say when you put your food down on the table at least how it is in our house it's literally like gordon ramsay reality show where everyone's critiquing your dinner (laughs) chickens to this or that's perfect sometimes it's like oh the streamings are perfect this time but Did you write down how you made it? No. (laughs) How are you going to make it again? Even my wife can't win even with that, with my oldest. My oldest is so tough on her. Even when she succeeds, my my daughter's like, but you're never going to be able to make it again because you don't write it down. You don't know how much salt you put. It says salt to taste. But what if your taste is different next week? Whatever. So like my poor wife, my wife's a great cook, you know. But I say it to you because before I started cooking, the appreciation I had for my wife was, you know, appreciation. But once I started going through the hell 
of cooking and cleaning and shopping and doing all these things for cooking, then I appreciated what she went through. So now when she puts food on the table, there's a moment of real gratitude because I've, I've walked in those shoes. I know how mm -hmm. difficult it is. And I think it's important as husbands or spouses in general to make sure our children see the gratitude that mm -hmm. we have for our spouses or partners, because at the end of the day, you know, we could easily take for granted those relationships, yeah. you know, you'd be like, well, you know, you're my spouse and this is what you do. You have your job and I have my job, but every day, every day to stop and not just feel gratitude, but speak it. Mm -hmm. Words are very, very powerful. Do my kids mm -hmm. know that I love them? Sure. They know. I need to tell them, you know, another thing that I do is I, I put adjectives in front of my kids' names just to remind them how I see them. I call my son, you know, I, I call him my sweet son. He needs to know, like, he's sweet, you know, or, or whatever adjective they need to know to, to let them know how I see them. It's always never just how I look, about who they are, their qualities. You know, my wife and I have a, a tradition that every, uh, every Friday night um, we give our kids uh, a little a whisper uh, at dinner. Uh, we, uh, we're Jewish and we observe the Sabbath and it's called Shabbat and Shabbat comes Friday night sundown and I don't work for 24 hours. Okay. That means Friday, the iPhone is shut off. The email is shut off from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, sun, sundown. That's 24 hours oh. where there is not, not, not permitted to work. And I'm telling you guys, it's been the greatest thing that I've ever done. And that our family's ever done. Let me tell you why. Because I come home, you know, from work or even working from home now. It's like a Tuesday night or it's a Wednesday night. And we're sitting at the dinner table. And there's a ping that comes on my phone. So what am I going to do? I'm going to check the ping. Because right. it could be a work thing. It could be important. Or you ever been in the car with your kids and you get a work call? Yeah. And you tell your kids, daddy's on the daddy's on the work. Everyone knows. If daddy says the word work, mm -hmm. like, you better be quiet. Why? Because it's daddy's money. And money is life and death. And there's nothing more important for daddy than work. Mm -hmm. But there is something more important. You know why daddy's doing all this work? For you. Yeah, but dad, why? If it's for me, why do I have to be quiet? Why do I have to leave the room every time you're on a work call? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But Friday night comes. And there's a ping. Daddy doesn't check it. I don't look at it. Nothing. Mm -hmm. We sit and we have a Friday night dinner with our family. The kids dress up in their most beautiful clothes. My wife makes a beautiful dinner. It's like a three-hour dinner. But at the start of the dinner, each one of my kids comes over and I give them a blessing. I put my hands on their head and I whisper something into their ear that's just for them. That's just for them that lets them know that I, I saw them this week, that what they're going through. Let's say my 16-year-old is studying so hard for a test or whatever she's going through. And I'll whisper in her ear, I'll be like, honey, I know that you're, you're working hard at this test. I want you to know that you, you, you can do it. I believe in you. Mm. And if, if a week comes and one of my kids comes up to me and I don't know what to whisper, that means I didn't really see them this week. Mm. That means I just took that week for granted. I didn't really notice mm. them. So it forces me as a dad to make sure I know what's going on in my kids' lives. And then my wife gives them a whisper also. And then we have this dinner together. And then the next day, Saturday, it's all just like, meals and taking walks and stories and board games and singing. It's incredible. I mean, just fr this past Friday, we sat down in our living room as a family and just all talked for like 30 minutes before we even went to dinner. Wow. Just And like, when does a family do that? Without devices, without Netflix, mm -hmm. without these, just sit together. So I urge anyone listening, you know, forget if Jewish or not, it doesn't matter. Make sure that in your schedule of life that you have, and this is the most important part I want to make, is a set time to be with your family. Here's what it means. It doesn't mean shoehorn them in whenever work isn't as difficult. Mm. What it means is every Sunday morning, whatever it is, at whatever day you like, Sunday morning from wake up to noon, there's no work especially for a dad or a mom, for a career person, there's no work. Mm -hmm. You are not, make yourself a window that you're not permitted to check your email. Oh, but what happens if you get a ping? You know what? No one's going to die. Unless you're a doctor and you're on, on call, no one's going to die. And I'm just telling you as a, as a, a, as a dad mm -hmm. or a mom, whoever's working, you know how difficult it is because every moment you know that you could be doing something to further your career. Every moment you can. Forget about your kids for a minute. Do you know how incredible it is to give ourselves a moment to know that right now 
Not that I won't further my career. I can't. You know why I can't? Because I set a window of time mm -hmm. that I'm not going to work on my career. And when you give yourself that window, believe me, if you knew you had one day to live, you wouldn't be furthering your career. So mm -hmm. why not take one day every week and treat it as if it's the most important day where you appreciate the things and the people that are most meaningful to you? That's, that's been a great tool for our family. That's powerful. That's powerful. Crazy, yeah. right? You know, it's it's funny because you hear you hear some really successful people say things like that, like I take a day off or I take several hours, and then you wonder how do they get so much done and they're still able to take a day off. And you're absolutely right. I mean, you you pay attention to the people that are important to you in your life, give them that much attention. So I'm I'm sure while you're busy working on the on these amazing projects, you don't feel the guilt of I'm not with my family because you know, hey, I'm I'm gonna Boom. give them. Friday, Saturday, a hundred percent. Yeah. Cause you hear, you hear that all the time. Career careers can as parents, you start feeling this weight on your shoulders. Like, man, how do I juggle both? And, and you just yeah. gave a perfect example of, of a way to do it. By the way, you know, uh, growing up in the nineties, well, I was working in the nineties at Disney. You know, I'd go to work every day uh, as an animator and I had no computer. No one had email back then. Believe it or not, people. Okay. This is a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember going to work and I would work. I was working on Mulan and I had a phone next to my desk with a little red light if you had a message, you know, one of those work phones, right? And uh, if there was a message the next day, I would take the message, whatever. But when I left the office every day, there was no one could ever call me at home. No one, they, the work didn't call me, they didn't have my home number. I don't even think I had a cell phone back then. There was no cell phone. Okay. Yeah. That's a long time. I was like, really? No cell phone. No cell phone, people. Long time ago. <laughs> it's the dark so, ages. That ha that happened in history? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but the coolest thing is when you left work, you left work now. Yeah. You know, emails are coming in all day and night. And if you think you're going to be that worker who's not going to respond to those, you're going to come off lazy. You have to have, you have to be responding 24 seven. Mm. Mm -hmm. Unless you have that set time. And I think that's an important, just a tool for everyone listening is to know that it's not something, like I said, that you're shoehorning in your family whenever you're free. Mm. You have a set time. That tells your family, it tells you this is important equally, if not more than my work. You have a set time for work, don't you? You have to work mm. from nine to 10 or whatever it is. So why not have a set time for your family? That way your kids also know that maybe I didn't see my mom or dad this week at this time, but Sunday morning or Sunday, the whole day. And a lot of you listening right now, I know a lot of you listening right now are thinking this sentence. Yes, all that sounds nice, but that could never work for me. I'm telling every single one of you, you're wrong. Mm. And you want to prove it to yourselves? Try it out. Yep. Try it out. You want to have a better marriage? You you want to have that feeling in your in your mind that yeah I'm there for my kids. Look, even if you're an, in in uh, an invested dad, you still have that feeling that yeah I could have been there more for my kids. When you hold your your kid your two year old shirt that they wore too, and then now they're sixteen, and you look at you look at those pictures yeah. of when they were young, and it's beautiful. But there's also I don't know at least I go through that pain of oh I wish I was there more for them. I wish did I did I really appreciate when they were young so much? Mm -hmm. It went by so fast. Oh, if I could go back once and hold that little hand and walk through Main Street Disneyland just mm -hmm. one more time with because now because she wants to hang out with her friends, or mm -hmm. if I could just have a tea party with my daughter again, like we used to have with no tea in the cup, and now she wants to hang. If I could just do one more of those and just remember what her voice sounded like at that age, like amazing. But because we all know that it, it's a blink of an eye. This window when they live in our homes, it's a blink of an eye. It goes by so fast. We have to make sure that we invest the most valuable thing we have, which is not money. It's our time. Wow. I keep I keep forgetting that I'm supposed to be asking you questions because I'm just taking everything <laughs> you're, you're saying in Seriously. straight straight to heart. It's, and I and I went through some of that as I was going through some extra bands and stuff of their elementary years and going through papers and finding old t-shirts of like kindergarten, you know, um, t-shirts and this kind of stuff and just remembering and, and wondering if at that time, did I go to enough lunches? Was I, was I present even though I was there, but was I present when I was taking them to school? Did I, did I show them that, um, that I appreciated their time, that I was grateful and that I, that I loved them. And, and I, start to second guess as my kids are my son's 18 graduates from high school here pretty soon and my daughter there you go. Yeah. about turned 17 and i wow. 
I, I try to then recognize the mistakes that I've made as a dad and hope I've done, I've done more good than bad. Did I, was I Mm. at some point in time, will I, will they realize all the good I did? Right. Um, Will they they look back positive or will they look back negative? Right. (laughs) Yeah, and that's and that's harder as as my impact on them directly becomes less and less, as you say, like you know when they go hang out with friends more and and one of these other things. And I remember the time we did a we did a trip to Disney World, and it was for the <clears throat> Mickey Scary Halloween and and dressing up. You know, they my daughter was Peter Pan and my son was Captain America, and wow. I was I wore a sh- t shirt as the shield, and I was his shield. Anytime he wanted a shield, I'd stand in front and uh, like to get awesome. that time back yeah um i would i would give anything right um to have i would give any future success i have any any property i would give years of my life to have that moment again right uh, with them you know you know jim Rohn, um who was tony robbins mentor he was the tony robbins for tony robbins so he had this incredible idea that he shared this quote he said that in life, we get to choose to have either two um, two pains. We're, no one's going to escape pain in life. Everyone's going to go through pain. He says we get to, at the end of our lives, we get to have gone through two pains. Either the pain of regret, of looking back and knowing that we could have done more, been more, spent more time. Either that pain we're going to feel mm-hmm. or we get to choose the pain of working on ourselves, of discipline. You know, being a father who's invested in your kid, I won't call it pain, but I'll say it's a struggle. It takes work. It takes sacrifice. You know, when you pick your kids up from school, you're in the car with them for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing in the car? You're doing a work call? When my kids get in the car, when I pick them up, I have a rule. I will never be on a work call. When my kids get in that car, the first thing they're going to see dad do is smile at them and go, welcome into (laughs) our family again. Like, hi, how was your day? Smiling at them. Do you think they want to get in the car after the day? And they want to be like, oh, dad, oh, we have to talk. Dad is on a work call. Mm. And guess what? Whoever you're in the work call with, you know what you do? You tell them. I've done this all the time. I got to go. I'm picking up my kids. I got to go right now because when my kids get in the car, I'm only talking to them. Hang up the phone. I'm not saying that's painful, but I'm saying it takes work. And at the end of our lives, I don't want to have that regret that I could have spent more time. You know, when you're giving your kids a bath when they're little, there's a window of time. You talk to them. When my kids are in the car, I talk to them. There's little windows of time. You take every one of those and you put the same focus that you have for your career into a conversation with your children, and you're going to build a relationship with them. And it's not just about our ego. It's not just do I want to wake up one day and know that my kids thought of me as a great dad. Okay, of course we want that. That's a legacy. But really, when we love our children, what do we want them to do? We want them to be able to go out into the world and stand confidently and be able to balance life. And we want them to learn from our mistakes. So because we want to give them those life skills, We have to make sure that the relationship we have with them is always a constant drip. It's like the drip irrigation, like the little water drips, you know, when they're planting Mm -hmm. things, you don't just pour the water on. You don't just do that with kids. You don't just pour on wisdom and teach them everything. It's the drip irrigation. Every Mm -hmm. day, you're teaching them a little bit more about all aspects of life, but especially to appreciate those windows of time that we have with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, so let me ask you. You have since you have four kids, it's kind of crossed my mind. You're you're a creative. Is your, your wife is creative as well? Is that? Well, she's. I think everyone uses creativity to solve problems. She's not artistically creative, but boy, does she use creativity to entertain, occupy, love, nurture our children. You know, she she she's definitely exhibits creativity. Yeah. Do you see the? Out of the four kids, do you see any of them possibly following your career path as when they become older? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, I think that all children are artists. Every kid's an artist because art really is an expression of what's going on inside me. Now, Mm -hmm. can some kids draw better than other kids? Okay, maybe. But as far as art as an expression, 
you know, there's a, there's a subject called art therapy out there. There's art mm-hmm. therapy is that people use art to express what they're feeling. Well, children especially have a very interesting lens, the way they look at the world and art when they're making art, uh, especially as children, it tells us a lot about what's going on inside them. When a child does a painting or a drawing of a family holding hands, or there's a rainbow above and it's a sunny day that tells you it's a happy kid. That's a happy kid. And there's experts out that can show you the artwork of kids whose parents fight and who argue and kids who have, uh, you know, major anxiety and it, it shows in their art. So, um, yeah, all of our kids, we've, we've definitely nurtured them to have an outlet of art, but specifically in filmmaking, uh, or animation, um, you know, our kids, uh, when, when, when our oldest, who's now 17 almost, when she was, uh, I think, one and a half, or maybe even younger, uh, somebody stopped us on the street and said to my wife, oh, you know, your kid looks like the Gerber baby. You know, the Gerber baby, like that logo, <laughs> that little yeah. round head. Yeah. And, and then they said, there's an audition for the next Gerber baby. You should put your daughter in. They're looking for a little boy. And our daughter was a girl but no one could tell because when she was like you know eight months old she's at that round head you know no like almost no hair so my wife takes her on this audition to be the gerber baby she didn't get it but my wife got the bug because my wife used to be a producer associate producer at disney so she's like oh this could be i went from reproducer well producer to reproducer (laughs) not a producer again so she started this uh, avenue where she would start taking my daughter uh on auditions and then sure enough she started booking stuff Mm. booking this ad for this or this car commercial whatever and then when she was about i think four or five she uh she booked a voiceover gig for disney on the show phineas and ferb which was really cool now just because i work at disney i had no pool I didn't work at Disney television then. I was just a dad. And my wife was taking these, our daughter and future kids, uh, she took them also on auditions. And she booked Phineas and Ferb. I mean, she had talent and she had a real great scratchy voice and she could she could act. But they all did different acting along the way. But our son, who's almost 13, when he was six, we noticed that he could sing beautifully and he could hit like perfect pitch and harmonize. And we thought, oh, you know what? Maybe he'd be great for voiceover. So we get him the same agent my daughter has, and he's six years old. And an audition comes in for the movie Hotel Transylvania 2. Mm-hmm. Remember those movies, Adam mm-hmm. Sandler? Yeah. So I take the lines with him, and I record in my iPhone. And you know, when you're directing a kid who can't read because they're six, they can't read yet, right? So you have to do the voice. It's called line reads. You do the, the words as a director, and the kid has to mimic it. So if, as a director, I say, but dad, when can we go? He'll say, but dad, when can we go? It's like notes, ba, 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 do, ba, right? Mm-hmm. It's notes. So we record and we send it in. And sure enough, like two weeks later, we get a call. They want him to come into the studio. So me and my wife drive him to Sony Studios. And it's a huge movie studio. We take him to this audition. And there's like 100 kids out there running around. It's crazy. And it's one thing for him to do the lines with us and our phone, like in our living room. But he's six years old. He's going to go into a room. There's strangers, producers, directors. So they call him. And he goes into this room and our ears are next to the door listening and he hits it out of the park, hits it out of the park. He eventually got cast as the main character in Hotel Transylvania 2. The kid is Dennis, the kid with the red hair. Remember that what? kid? Yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. Our, that's our son, Asher, which was just such a cool uh, opportunity. So, yeah, they uh, and they've all done different things. Uh, our daughter, Naomi, she was in uh, the, the Bigfoot movie that came out a couple years ago. Uh, and uh, Liel, uh, she was in uh, a Barbie thing and Meera has done stuff. They've all they've all done little things here and there. But I will tell you this, that, you know, we don't we don't push them into this. You know, a lot of times I get parents that call me all the time. Actually, mm-hmm. not a lot, like almost daily. Do I get a text or an email from somebody who's tracked me? And they'll give me <laughs> kid once to, there's she's five years old and she's gonna be an artist. What can I do? And my advice is always the same. Just don't put any pressure on them and give them the opportunity to create. Let them enjoy it at that mm-hmm. age. Once they get to be 16, well, now it's time to turn on the discipline. And then I'll suggest certain art books or whatever. And I'm sure from this interview, people are going to go, oh, I'm going to find Saul and I'm going to attack him with my questions. <laughs> so, but uh, I guess I would say this is that make sure as parents, we do this. Number one, make sure we nurture different facets of our children. 
whether we're interested in it or not. I could be a dad that's not into sports. Does that mean your kids shouldn't be exposed to sports? Why, you're oh, supposed man. to raise your kid to be you? Oh, I'm a dad that plays piano. My kid's going to play piano because I played piano. Oh, so it's all about you. Mm. No. Make a, make a list of the, of the genres of activities that you want your kid to be exposed in. It's like what I said earlier in the interview. Yeah. It's always about clarifying. Clarify what kind of opportunities I want to give my children outside of my ego and me. And make sure, like even in the beginning, we have four kids. How do we know what musical instrument? How do we know they want music at all? So we mm -hmm. got them different music teachers. We got a lot of instruments. We got a piano. We got right, a guitar. Let them try. Yeah, let them try. Let, let them, them try. taste everything. Let them exactly. That's great. Mm -hmm. Now, so yeah, taste yeah. the buffet. You know, taste the buffet. By the way, it's another thing about food is a big deal. You know, we have friends in there. It's all they eat corn dog, or chicken nuggets. That they take it. You know, our kids are eating like everything that we eat. And uh, parents mm -hmm. say, "How do you get your kids to do that?" Because first of all, our kids don't make money. They don't buy food at supermarkets, and they don't want to go hungry. <laughs> so, right. uh, I'll so be honest. rather than die, they're going to eat the food. What? Tell me, Nelson. Do you have I one mean, of these? You, no, you've mentioned food so many times. I'm ready to take a flight out. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. either, either you're mentioning because you're inviting us or I'm not I'm not sure what's <laughs> happening here. I didn't even realize it. <laughs> you can't keep doing that. Coming out me, man. I know. We'll, see, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. But um, I guess so. what, I, what I mean is like make sure as parents – that we expose our children to the buffet of life. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Make sure we expose them to the buffet of life and allow them to choose, not necessarily what they like, but to choose who they want to become. Because mm -hmm. the most difficult thing about being a teacher, and that's what a parent is, is nurturing a child, a student, to become themselves. Mm. Boom. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. That is, and, that, and that's hard. And that's hard. And done. Like, and that's so hard. good. <laughs> that's hard. That's hard. Yeah. You know, you think you have a certain kid that's going to be the, the the apple tree, and if you give the apple tree what the apple tree needs, you might find out that you actually had an orange tree the whole time. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure, as parents, that we are not just nurturing what. See, you can nurture the character that you want them to have, the values. But how they um, interpret those and how they make them part of themselves, that's up to them. And guess what? You want it to be up to them. That's where confidence comes from. You want them to be able to stand on their own two feet. I remember when I was a kid growing up, I had some like tough years with school. I was getting some bad grades. And because I was just drawing constantly, creative, and I just couldn't sit there in chemistry and, you know, and I was just like bored. And I had some bad grades in the report card, I remember. And I come home and, uh, I thought my mom was going to kill me because my brother, my older brother was an A student and my twin sister, I have a twin sister. She was an A student and I was the screw up artist, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And, uh, and so my mom takes me, she sits me down outside. I remember we're sitting in the front outside and she says to me, I want you to know, she puts her hand on my back. I think it's about, um, I think it was about 11 years old. She puts her hand on my back and she says, I want you to know that you can you can go and step forward and take risks in life, and I'll always be here for you. Mm. My hand will always be here for you to fall back on. And rather than just discipline the bad grades, what she realized was that I was a kid who was, while I had all these other interests and things, I didn't have the confidence in myself because this is important. The bad grades made me identify myself as a bad student, mm. as a bad student. And when you think of yourself and identify yourself as something negative, that will prohibit you from being able to have confidence in yourself, mm. whether you realize it or not. At his 11, I didn't realize that, but she as an attentive mother could see that in me. And what she wanted me to know in that moment was, I believe in you. Whenever you're ready to step, not pushing me, not pushing me, but letting me know I believe in you and you can take your risks, but I'm always here. It's like a trapeze artist. Trapeze artists, they can do whatever they want in the air as long as they're aware that if they fall, they're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you're up on the trapeze and there's no net there, you're going to be nervous. You're not going to take that step. And that's the job of a parent. The job of a parent is let your kids know, not just always by words, but by actions, that I'm that net for you. Walk on the trapeze, take those risks, 
you know, and guess what? You will fail. That's okay. That's how you learn. Right. Yeah. I, if, if I understand what you're saying, Sean, you can help me clarify my 10 year old son should just drop out of school is what you're saying. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> just drop right out and go draw, dude. I, right? I missed it. I missed it. I missed the, no, you, you know, Sean. Yeah. Help me out there. Help me out. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a different way of thinking is what, is what you're kind of talking about. And something I had a conversation with my kids during, during the pandemic is they both were full online and towards a lot of years of, of high school. And, um, they were both struggling with school for a little bit and it was just there was so much trauma associated with being yeah. being sheltered at home and not being around their friends and my son's you know for the most part his last two years of high school he's been in a pandemic for it along with you know thousands of other kids that are out there and i just yeah. sat them both down and i said in in five to six years uh, and let me preface this before i start getting a lot of hate mail yes grades are important but listen to my full message before you send me that email in five to six years, more than likely, no one is going to remember what you got in math. But people are going to remember the type of person that you are. Mm. So at the end of the Beautiful. day, yes. if you are a loving, caring, open, graceful person, that's what matters to me. I will always support whatever you do. I will help you in any way you need it. That is most important in life is how you are inside and how you treat other people. Everything else will work out. I firmly believe that. And that's with a lot of therapy and a lot of praying. I've, I've come to understand that. But it's trying to instill on them when at their age, every day is important. Every decision is a big deal. Hmm. Try to understand. Just be who I know who you are inside of you. Beautiful. And everything else will work out. Hmm. That that is such a powerful message, you know. Um, people, uh, uh, I grew up in the '90s, and Michael Jordan was my hero, big hero uh, for me. I'm a big MJ fan. My son uh, goes to school; he has to defend Daddy because all his friends say LeBron James. You know, but I'm like, dude, MJ, come on, right? <laughs> you know this. So uh, anyway, it's funny because it, it's not my son defending Michael Jordan; he's defending Daddy because yeah. Daddy loves Michael Jordan. <laughs> But, um, you know, if you watch Michael Jordan at the Hall of Fame speech when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, he uh, he looks out to his kids. You know, he's filled in this giant room and everyone he ever played with and all his coaches are there, Dean Smith from North Carolina and all his coaches, you know, Doug Collins and Pat Riley and Magic Johnson's there, all his players and Pippen, they're all there. And Jordan gets up there and he looks out to the audience. And he goes through one story after another about how this person added to his competition and made him better and better. And then he looks out to his kids and he says, and to my kids, I'd hate to have to be you. I'd hate to have to live in the shadow. Yeah, I'm watching your face, your face Nelson. Mm. That, right? You see, I, I don't want to, I'm not judging MJ, you know, I, his relationship with his kids is his. But I remember watching that and thinking, mm. You know what? I think that was a missed opportunity. I think what he could have said to his kids is, you know what, kids? I'm an example. I'm an example of a kid that was cut from his JV team who worked harder than anyone that I ever met to achieve what I want. And if I could do that, you can do it. Yeah. Like just as an uplifting, positive thing. Empower them. Of, he, empower yeah. them. Yeah, Nelson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead, he looked at them and he's like, I'd hate to have to be you. Now, look, I don't know what it's like to be Michael Jordan or to have to raise kids. So maybe he's coming at it from a different angle. But the reason I bring it up is because you think that when you see celebrity, you know, what it must be like to have been Michael Jordan's kids. Okay. Yeah. They got to have, you know, floor seats at the Bulls games. They were rich and they had houses and Bentleys and cars and vacations and right. VIP service and every restaurant, all those things. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, basketball is only one facet to the diamond that Michael Jordan is. Mm -hmm. A diamond is bright because it gets many facets. And no matter how great he was at basketball, that's only one facet. There's another facet on that diamond called fatherhood. And that facet should hopefully have the same investment and work that he put into basketball and to father. You know, when Kobe Bryant was killed, the world was shattered. And I still get goosebumps thinking about that and how he died and with his daughter and the other people. It was a terrible thing. 
that we'll all feel for a long time. And what's so interesting to me is that when he was killed, a lot of the articles and the media that was written wasn't about his basketball. It was about what kind of father he was. Yeah. And I thought that that was a really interesting thing. I realized one day, you know, he was probably this awesome father because mm -hmm. the Mambo mentality wasn't just on the court. It was about life. It was all aspects of life. And I guarantee, and I don't know this, but I guarantee that the same investment he put in and discipline and pain that he put into basketball, he put into fatherhood, to working on his marriage, which wasn't public, which was wasn't perfect. He had his ups and downs in marriage. You can read all about it. We all know about it. Very public, he was humiliated yeah. and embarrassed, mm -hmm. but he worked at it. And yeah. the reason I bring it up, Sean, uh, is because at the end of the day, what Kobe's kids will remember about him, what Michael's kids will remember about him isn't basketball. It's mm -hmm. what kind of father he was. And, mm -hmm. you know, I say people are like, oh, it's so cool. You worked on Disney movies. Someday my kids, all of our children, are going to stand at a gravestone. I don't. It's not morbid, guys. It's reality. Never. You know, we're all going to die one day and we leave a legacy of children. And what do they? What do we want them to remember about us? Do we want them to remember that we worked on Disney movies, that we played basketball, that we did all these things? That's not what's important. What we really want them to remember mm. is the character traits. It's, did my dad live a life of integrity? Did my life try? Did my dad try to grow as a man? Not was he perfect. Did he try to grow? You know, Sean said it beautifully. He's like, someday, he said to his children, someday, five years from now, 10 years, no one's gonna remember what you got in math. But what kind of character did you develop? What kind of attributes did you work on? Every single one of us should make a list of the negative character traits that we have. Guess what? We all have them. Yeah. You know what we do though? We all make lists of how everyone around us should change. If you're married, believe me, you could make a list of how you wish your spouse treated you differently. If your parents are still alive and you're an adult, believe me, your parents aren't going to tell you when you screw up in life. They're, they walk on eggshells around you because they know mm -hmm. you're in control of the relationship now because every relationship is defined by its weakest link. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means if my mom wants to talk to me every day, but I want to talk to her once a week, you know, often I'm going to talk to my mom once a week. I define the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So those relationships are defined by the weakest link. The person who, who invests the least defines how often you see each other. But those character traits and attributes that we have, those are the things, that's the legacy that we leave our children. And I want my kids to know, not that daddy was perfect, but man, did my dad try. Mm. And if you make a list of those negative character attributes that we all have, you know what life's about? There's one goal in life we should have. Make sure I make my effort to work on myself. Boom. Mm -hmm. That's it. Just to grow. Just to grow. Every one of those negative character attributes we have, we have the potential to turn them into a positive, to work on ourselves. You know, I'm an artist, so I was terrible at drawing hands when I was growing up. And my parents got me this art teacher to come to the house, and she would have me draw hands from different positions every day. She said, if you're terrible at drawing hands, you draw a hand from a different position every day, and you know what will happen in six months? You'll get better at drawing hands. And that's what I did. She knew to turn my weakness into my mm -hmm. strength. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan was Amazing. in the NBA the first year. After one game, sports writer comes up to him and says, Mike, you have no defensive game, dude. You're weak on defense. You know what Jordan could have said? Dude, I'm Michael Jordan. I got Air jo You're wearing my Air Jordan sneakers. Your kid probably has my <laughs> Michael Jordan posters wallpapered. Right. <laughs> I'm going to listen to you. It's $5 million up and down. But I'm going to listen to you. But Michael said in an interview years later, when that sports writer came up to him and said, you have no defensive game, Michael heard one thing. Something I'm doing is giving that guy the perception that I don't have a defensive game. I guess mm. I better work harder on defense. And, yeah, he won so and many defensive did. titles. What? And that next year, Nelson, he was named one defensive player of the year, number mm -hmm. 23. Because to be great in life, and we all want to be great, every single one of us is a fire in us, and we want to be great. We want great marriages. We want to be great parents. We want to have great careers. And we right. want to have greatness in all aspects of life. How do you do it? There's only one way. The first thing is we need to know what our strengths are. Really know what our yeah. strengths are.
That's number one. That's the easy part. We know that. Number two, we need to know what our flaws are. But guess what? That's also the easy part. You know what separates good from great? You know what separates great from awesome? Awesome people. You watch a Netflix documentary about Michael or Steve Jobs or anybody that's done anything great. You know what you mm -hmm. will find commonality about every one of them? They took their flaws and they made an investment to turn them into action and to turn them into strengths. I guarantee when Steve Jobs finished making the first iPhone, he probably took that iPhone, showed it to all his people in his boardroom. They did a, a cheers. They had champagne. He probably said to them, tell me tomorrow how we can make it better. Great people look real, realistically at where their flaws are and say, I'm going to turn those into my strengths. And ultimately, those character flaws that we have, that's our mission in life is how do I work on myself and grow? Mm. That's the legacy we want to leave our children. So you literally answered Sean, Sean probably thinking, like Sean typically, that's one question he'll ask um, as we're coming, as we usually come co close to ending things up, what's the legacy and, and your answer, honestly, um, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping people take that in and, and take that serious because you're absolutely right. We, we can all change. We're all at a place of, you know, we're starting yeah. from the same place. Our kids are, are watching, they're paying attention to us. And that's extremely empowering to the kids to see, wow, my dad, my dad grew as a person as I grew up as well, like they're watching that right. happen. So, yeah. so it's, it's wonderful that you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, how you want your kids to perceive, the, you know, your legacy and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about it a lot. And, uh, you know, also in, in marriage, just to talk just for a quick second, I know we're ending, but about marriage, you know, if you think right now for a moment, um, uh, take a tree and you cut it like a cross section, there's all those rings of a tree. Think of everybody in your life right now. If you're driving your car right now, while you're driving, just focus. Think about all your Facebook friends, or your Instagram friends, people that are in that outer circle. I'm sure many of you who are on Facebook or even Instagram have people that are there, your friends that you don't even know, okay? So what if somebody who's on your outer circle texts you and says, you know what? I heard you speaking last week or I heard you do something. Or I saw you in the store and you weren't acting so humble. You'd be like, I'm sorry, who are you? Yeah, we're Facebook. I don't even know you. Could you get out of my face? Like, be friend, unfriend, whatever. But as we go closer to the center of the circle, we hopefully have people that we get closer and closer and closer to. Now let's go to the inner, inner circles. We're talking family. Think about your family right now. Or maybe you have a best friend who's in that inner circle. Someone there. What makes them a best friend or a close family? Are they the ones that are going to tell us when we screw up in life? Or are they the ones that are always going to just pat us on the back and tell us everything we do is great, everything we do is right? Because what I'm saying is at the end of the day, if we're truly going to grow, then we must have one, just one, at least just one perspective from one person other than us who can tell us when it's real, when we are, when we are doing something great or when there's something we need to work on. Mm. And you know what? Hopefully in my marriage with my wife, we have a foundation of trust that we can look in each other's eyes and tell each other the great stuff that each other's doing and the stuff that we have to work on because there's a foundation of trust. Because if I'm going to grow in life, I can't go at it alone. Mm. And in any business partnership, relationship, any relationship at all, if two people always have the same point of view, one person is useless. The only way to really grow a marriage is not to look at this spouse and say, you know what? I really, really want them. No, it's to look like I really, really need them. You know, there's this idea that men couldn't drive their car, pull over and ask for directions. This is before navigators. Remember those days, guys, right? Why? Because I'm a man and a man has to be strong. A man has to have the answers for everything. When you were dating your wives, in the beginning, you know, you'd clean out the car, you'd put on cologne, right? You were the Mac daddy. You were the cover of GQ every time you saw her, right? Mouthwash all the time. Now you're married 20 years later. She ain't getting the cover of GQ anymore. Is what she? is mouthwash at this point? There you go. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what is so, that? Right. What is that? Because now we're much more, we're much more the real us. But I guess what I'm really saying is that in order to have a relationship of trust, we have to have a relationship of vulnerability. 
Mm. See, real intimacy is vulnerability. I have to allow that person to see the real me. And if I'm going to grow in life, I need to have that for my spouse or partner or friendship or any relationship of someone close. And hopefully when we have that kind of relationship in our home, our kids can see that. Mm. And they will ultimately communicate to us their vulnerability. You want to have a teenager that tells you what's going on when she's dating? Or when he's dating, you want to know what's really going on in their life? How many parents listening right now are like, I wish I knew what my kid was really doing. I mm -hmm. wish my kid would come up to me and tell me what's really going on. Mm -hmm. You mean what you wish is that your kid would speak to you with vulnerability. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Most kids don't do that. Why? Because if I tell my mom and dad what I'm doing, they're just going to judge me. They're just mm -hmm. going to judge me. Yep. They're going to judge me. Yep. Here's a great tool. If you're listening right now and you have a teenager, it's a great tool. And this starts when? When they're like four years old, five years old, always. Anytime your child ever shares with you something that they are doing in school or with their friends, the first things out of our mouths should not be, here's what I think about it. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, they don't know what they did was wrong and they're going to tell you. And you're going to tell them you didn't like what they did. And as they get older, they're going to get smarter. They're going to realize when they did something that mom and dad won't like. Don't and they're already going to know how you're going to react. They're not going to tell you. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if the first thing that your kid knows that when they tell you something as a teenager, the first thing they know is, you know what, my, no judgment from my parents. Mm. They're just going to listen. Now, of course, as parents, we do have to make a judgment because we have to help them. We have to give them discipline. Sometimes they'd be like, no, you can't go do that with your friends. There's a parameter. But don't we want to have relationships with our teenagers where they tell us these things and they open up to us? We want them to tell them. And then, you know what will happen? They'll come to us and ask us for advice. You don't have to offer it all the time. They will literally sit you down and go, mom, dad, what do you think to do? How to get to that relationship with your kids? Show them that it's okay to be vulnerable. How? In all your relationships as a parent, in your marriage, show them that it's okay, that you can ask for advice, that you can ask, that you can admit a flaw that lets them know that my parents aren't perfect. I don't have to be perfect either. Hmm. I am, uh, yeah, I'm going to probably listen to this episode a few times. I mean, you've, you've just provided so much knowledge and, um, been so vulnerable and open to us and, and sharing your life examples that I, I am very grateful for your time. And I, and I hope, um, the whole point why we're doing this podcast and why Nelson and I started this is, is as much fun as we have doing it, we, we really hope that there's that there's that dad that's listening, that soon-to-be dad, the foster dad, the stepdad that is at a point in their life when this bit of advice that our guests and especially that saw with what you're sharing this entire time, ha they have their light bulb moment. They know they're not the only one doing it. They know they can get through it. And this is why we are willing to give our time and why we're grateful for our guests that do. And thank you so much, Saul, for, for everything that you're, that you're sharing today. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. I appreciate your, your sharing that, but I want to just tell also that this is a really new thing. I mean, having a, having a forum where two dads, like two of you are sharing the struggles of fatherhood and, and trying to, you know, bring on guests to talk about tools to help. That's, that's new. Our parents didn't do that. Our dad didn't have that. Our grandfathers didn't have that. Nobody talked about struggles, what it meant to be a man, you know, 50 years ago. Nobody talked about that. So hopefully, because of the efforts that you guys are making, you guys should be commended on uh, on, mm -hmm. on setting this, uh, this, using your abilities and talents and time to be able to provide an outlet to share and to hopefully inspire dads listening to realize that, you know what, you're not alone. We're all going through this. And if we share our stories together and share our methods and tools, that hopefully at the end of the day, we will leave that legacy of, of being great dads. And great dads does not mean being perfect. It means literally, I just want to grow. So I commend you guys. I wish you so much continued success. And I'm so appreciative that you gave me an opportunity to share uh, some of these ideas. So th thank you so much, guys. You're awesome, Saul. Yeah, just as, as we wrapped up, we, we need to... In the tradition of the Dads Unplugged podcast, you got to give us a dad joke, make us laugh, or a dad story, <laughs> but you got to give us something that's so awful that it's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, 
it's crazy because like you know you hear the phrase dad jokes and I definitely say them daily. I'm lucky because I have one kid who laughs at my dad jokes. Yes, she rolls her eyes, but she laughs at them all. <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, yeah, I thank God for my 14 year old. She laughs at all my dad jokes. But I, I guess I'll share you one one story. Um, a couple years back, we took the kids to the Grand Canyon, and we took them on this train. Uh, that takes you and it has like the, has like an old west show that goes through the train because like like a four hour train train ride whatever it was a couple hours from whatever town we were in to get to the Grand Canyon it was like two hours on the train and at one point this guy's at the front he's got a cowboy hat he's like hey ladies and gentlemen buckaroos anybody have a joke who's got a joke and he goes over <laughs> with the microphone and he's going over to everyone's telling jokes and uh, there's this one joke I taught my kids like when they were little. So we go over to Naomi, and she was, uh, it must have been like five at the time, you know, a little kid voice, little girl, yellow pigtails, blonde hair, a little pink dress. And I go, Naomi, go up to the thing and tell them the joke. She's like, no, no, I'm not. I'm like, honey, do it. You can, okay. So she walks all the way up to the train. The guy's like, hey, buckaroo, hey, there's a little princess right there. You got a joke for your old pal here? So he grabs the microphone. He puts it up to her. He puts the mic right up to her face, and she goes, yeah, I have a joke. Here's the joke. Why did the monkey fall out of the tree? And the guy goes, well, I don't know, little lady. Why did the monkey fall out of the tree? And she says, because he was dead. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and this cowboy's face <laughs> dropped. And the entire train paused and then burst into tears laughing. <laughs> that is awesome. And she basically dropped the mic and went <laughs> back to her seat. But <laughs> oh my that's my God. favorite. That's you know, sometimes so as a dad, it is fun to encourage our kids wow. to go out there and shake up a room. Now <laughs> that is awesome. I'm over here waiting for a punchline. The damn monkey's dead. <laughs> Why did the monkey <laughs> fall out of the tree? Because it was wow. dead, like just a, such a dark joke from this little Cindy perfect. Brady kid, you know. Perfect. Yeah, that was good. That, that was, was good. good. <sighs> in in one of our, our other traditions, we always ask a "Would you rather?" question. Okay, my Bring son loves the "Would you rather?" questions. You're gonna answer first. Full. I need full dis honesty, and you got to give a little bit of a backing why you picked your answer. Then Sean can go ahead. Sean's just unsure of why I do this, but I have to. So here we go. We're going to do, um, we'll do this. Would you rather go about your day naked or fall asleep for a year? Oh, man. How do you come up with these questions? <laughs> Let's see. I mean, you, you got to pick one. Would you well, rather go technically, about your day naked? as my kids remind me all the time, we all are naked under our clothes. So, <laughs> I, full disclosure, uh, you, would you go by your Sean, name? You like that? No I like that. You, clever, clever. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, I would rather fall asleep for a year because I'm so dang busy. And the one thing I just never get my wife has this expression. I'm like, honey, I'm tired. I got to sleep. She goes, you'll sleep when you're dead. Now, like, let's get back to work. So, daddy could use a nap. So, I'm, I'm going to go for that one. I'm going to go for the nap. Dad's taking a nap. <laughs> taking All right. a nap. All right. Sean. Um, hmm. What are you doing, to, Sean? Trying to, trying to realize if I want to just, you know, add to um, – the oh, trauma and the therapy that people have to go through <laughs> if they see me walking around naked all the time. Um, You're talking like Trader Joe's naked. You're talking like, I mean, yeah. full blown. He's like full on birthday suit. You know um, what? I got to stop and get gas at the gas station. You can, have, you can wear a pair of socks on. And you know, Seinfeld has an episode. He talks about like, there's different kinds of naked. There's like nice naked, like good naked. And then there's like ugly naked. Like, <laughs> he, and he dates this girl. She walks around his apartment and she's like lifting up heavy boxes. You're like, eh, I don't want to see your body doing those things. You know, I think all this, <laughs> you know, um, I guess, I guess I'd say fall asleep for a year. I don't, I know I don't sleep enough. Um, as I, as my cardiologist and my girlfriend both says, I need to sleep more. Um, so probably it allow me to catch up on the not seven hours a night that I, Definitely don't get. There you go. You know, bring it home, else. I'm going out there. Are you going out <laughs> of there? Of course he is. <laughs> I mean, 
you're a Cuba Gooding Jr. and Jeremy Gardner. Hey, I air dry. You're Remember? welcome. You know, <laughs> you're welcome, <laughs> guys. Awesome. It's like, you know, saw so I'm coming over for some of that for some of that uh, tomato sauce. Tomato, tomato sauce. sauce. Good. You're welcome, guys. That's <laughs> Boom. it. I don't even. You know, I think so. I think uh, so. Well, let oh, me know man. what day that is because I'm not letting you in on that day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see you. I don't want to see from your ring, uh, eating you tomato see from your sauce. ring camera. It'll come on that's your phone. Right. Be like, oh no, no, nobody answer the phone. Stay away from the door. That's right. No, that's that's right. Why does he bending over to pick things up? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> Cuba Gooding, I air dry. I air dry. <laughs> that's it. That's oh it. man, so so thank you, thank you so so much for yeah. all of your time today. And um, again, I can't tell you how much we're grateful. Uh, for you to do this in your very busy schedule of yeah. all your responsibilities for your professional life and being uh, a husband and father. We just, man, grateful. You guys, thanks for having me. Uh, how can how can people, if they want to follow your career, follow your dad life, message you, get a hold of you, where can they get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm on Instagram at Saul.Blinkoff. So you can find me there. And on Instagram, I'm posting um, pictures of the family and I'm posting quotes and, and uh, lots of videos and stories. And, and um, I also have a podcast. So I'm putting a lot of uh, things from my podcast on Instagram. My podcast is called Life of Awesome. And uh, the way I came up with that name is because, you know, if somebody comes up to you and they're like, hey, man, how's it going? You'd be like, yeah, things are good. Most people say, yeah, it's good. What if somebody comes up to you and they say, how's things going? You go, let me tell you how things are going. Things are going awesome. They'd be like, why? What happened? Did you win the lottery? They're like, no, no, no. It's just awesome to be alive. Like, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be great if we woke up every day and just thought that every day was awesome? It didn't just have to be Sunday. It didn't have to just be more going on a vacation to Hawaii. Every day could be awesome. So that's how I came up with this title, Life of Awesome. And in, in my weekly podcast, it, it delivers every Friday. Some episodes are me and some are interviews. But basically, I'm talking about all the things that we were talking about today, guys, and relationships and marriage and parenthood, career, how to approach life every day. There are 15, 20-minute episodes to talk about all aspects of life and how that each one of us by the end of the day, can know that we lived a day of awesome and ultimately a, a life of awesome. Uh, so check that out. You can also check it out on my website, which is saulblinkoff.com. saulblinkoff.com. It has access to links to check out the podcast on Apple and Spotify and Stitcher and many other platforms. Um, and uh, I hope people check it out. Uh, you can DM me on Instagram. Um, I'm really good about responding and and uh, and commenting and building relationships with social media. I'm also on Facebook, so you can check me out there. And uh, really, again, appreciate the time. And uh, hoping uh, that this uh, was uh, was an episode that people will walk away with uh, some practical tools. Because it's one thing to hear somebody speak and be inspired or to read a book and be inspired, but it's another thing to say, how do I take those tools that I heard and actually implement them into my life? How do I take those tools and make them part of me? Because inspiration comes and goes. Inspiration falls through our fingertips. And if you leave this podcast or any of the episodes that Nelson and Sean are doing, and you leave these podcasts and you're just inspired, and it doesn't change how you live, then you just wasted your time. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is taking what you hear and writing out things that you've heard and turning them into action mm -hmm. and turning them into action. So you actually change and mm -hmm. actually grow. So again, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate the opportunity. You've been awesome, Sean. Uh, Sean, of course, Sean shows up all the time. So <laughs> you, you, you've been, you've been wonderful. And, and Sean again, was also awesome. Yeah, just, both of you. That's uh, questionable, but yeah, <laughs> Sean, Sean's been here the whole time. Yeah. That's... You guys are great. I love seeing you guys. Uh, this has been really fun. It's a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you and Saul so much for your time today and everyone, please, please follow up with Saul. Uh, his podcast is, is literally awesome. I listen to it whenever it launches. Um, and those that are listening, please subscribe and follow us. And if you have any questions, comments, let us know. We'd love to hear from you as well as any other fathers you'd like to see or hear on our podcast. Uh, everyone have a great day and thank you very much. <laughs>